but feel free to chat with each other in the chat. Um, put in where you're calling from and a favorite owl. All right, and without further ado, I would love to introduce to you Alex Waring from the Wildlife Center of Virginia. And Alex began training as a volunteer outreach docent at the center in 2015 and joined the full-time staff as an outreach coordinator in 2016. As a member of the outreach department, Alex works to create meaningful and lasting relationships with the public in a variety of ways, such as presenting educational programs, creating website and social media content, training volunteer docents, and providing care for the center's non-releasable education ambassadors. So welcome. Hi, thank you for that great introduction, Grace. As she mentioned, my name is Alex Waring. I'm the Outreach Coordinator at the Wildlife Center of Virginia, and I'm really excited to be speaking with everybody today. It looks like we've got a great turnout already, about 60 people online. That's really exciting to see. Um, just so you know about what to expect from my segment of the presentation, I'll, I'll spend about five minutes telling you about the history of the Wildlife Center of Virginia, kind of what we do and why we do it. And then for 20, 25 minutes after that, we'll have one of the center's live education ambassadors on camera. She's in the room right now. She's just off camera for this first little bit. Uh, and yeah, based, I'll, I'll let you guess what kind of animal you think it is based on the theme of the program, but you probably got a good idea. So the Wildlife Center of Virginia is a nonprofit teaching and research hospital, and we're located in Waynesboro, Virginia. We were founded in 1982. So over the course of more than three decades, we have provided emergency medical veterinary and rehabilitative care for tens of thousands of individual wild animals. Um, I don't know the exact number right now, but I do know that in our organization's history, we have surpassed 85,000 patients in total. And when I say patients, I'm referring specifically to native species that you would find here in the Commonwealth. Uh, that is partly due to the permitting conditions of any wildlife rehabilitator in Virginia. We are legally only allowed to care for species that are native to the Commonwealth. Um, so that sounds a little restrictive maybe at first, but when you think about how many species there are in Virginia, you start to get a good picture of what our typical patient load looks like. So of course we treat owls. There are about, I think, eight species of native owls found in Virginia. We treat some of those bigger, more charismatic animals like bald eagles, um, great horned owls, red-tailed hawks, even black bears. In fact, we're the only facility in all of Virginia that is permitted to care for black bears. Um, however, for, for all those native species, again, it's, it's the big, it's the small, it's the short, it's the tall, it's raptors, it's perching birds, it's reptiles like snakes and turtles, mammals like uh, woodchucks, beavers even. We do have some restrictions on species that we can treat, and that's mainly due to limitations on enclosures, what those species require. For example, adult white-tailed deer, that's a species that we don't rehabilitate because they require a lot of open space. And while we do have a pretty extensive um, property here with outdoor enclosures and indoor enclosures for recovering patients, there's only so much we can do. Uh, so of those 85,000 patients that we treat each year, some of them, of course, are able to be fully rehabilitated and we send them back out into the wild where they belong. That's the greatest success story that we can think of. That's not always the case, unfortunately, because we are a rehabilitation hospital that is really well staffed and we have uh, staff members that are really well trained in terms of wildlife veterinary medicine we tend to see a lot of really traumatic and I guess I'd call them emergency room style cases for animals. Some that have been hit by cars, they've been in fights with other animals, maybe they're suffering from a disease or sickness or toxicity from some substance. Uh, because we treat those really difficult to treat cases, not 100% of our patients are able to be returned to the wild. If they cannot find their own food, if they cannot fly or swim or run or crawl as well as they should be able to if they cannot interact behaviorally with other wild animals and humans appropriately we don't send them back out into nature uh, and sadly a lot of those cases do end in humane euthanasia but rarely there are patients 
that we treat in our hospital that are deemed non-releasable by our veterinary staff. And if those individuals are a species that is relatively easy to train to work with humans, if they're a species that we are able to keep ethically in captivity with enough space and the husbandry that they need, and most importantly, from an education perspective, if those non-releasable patients have a good story or a good background that we can use as an example, or we can use that individual as a representative for the rest of their species, then those non-releasable patients live with us here at the Wildlife Center for the rest of their lives. And at that point, we don't call them patients anymore. We call them our education ambassadors. And I really think of them as my coworkers. And that's who I'm gonna bring on camera in just a moment here. She is a, a, an animal that was born in the wild. She spent a portion of her life as a wild owl. I just spoiled the surprise. Uh, but she was deemed non-releasable. And for uh, I'll give you more on her specific history when you can see her. But for a long time, she's been on our education team, longer than me, in fact. So I'll go ahead and get her out. She'll be standing on a leather handling glove which means that I'm gonna step out of the picture frame for just a second. And when I come back, I'll introduce you to the star of our presentation. Okay, and here's the difficult part, putting my headphones back on with one hand. All right. Okay, so I have with me Gus, who is a barred owl. I got excited when I saw some of your comments in the chat that barred owls are some of your favorite species. Gus, uh, again, she was born in the wild. She hatched uh, in Virginia in 1994. That was 27 years ago. So she hatched in the wild, unfortunately, at some point, and we don't know the exact circumstance of this event, but she fell from her nest and uh, a private citizen nearby thought that Gus would make a good pet. So unfortunately, instead of bringing Gus to a permitted wildlife rehabilitator, this person decided they wanted to keep her in their house. And this went on for about two or three months, we believe. Uh, luckily, someone nearby in a different residence knew that this was happening and knew that keeping a migratory bird like a barred owl is illegal. It's illegal to keep these animals as pets. So the authorities were con contacted and Gus was confiscated. She came directly to the wildlife center. And again, that was in 1994. Unfortunately, by that time, the damage had already been done. Physically, Gus is healthy. She is a really great specimen of a fully matured, healthy female barred owl, but behaviorally, that's what makes her non-releasable because birds, when they're very young, when they hatch out of their eggs, they look to whatever's taking care of them in that really early stage of their development, and they will imprint on that thing that's taking care of them. That's a term you may have heard before, imprinting. It's where they will look to that caretaker and essentially copy their behavior. As far as behavioral sciences are aware, imprinting is a process that's permanent and non-reversible. So in the wild, Gus would have looked at her wild barred owl parents. She would have learned how to hunt, what animals are prey, what animals are dangerous. She would have learned how to communicate with other barred owls. But because she was in captivity, because she was in human possession during that important imprinting phase, instead, she thinks that she belongs with humans. Everything that I've observed about Gus in the past five years of working with her tells me that she doesn't believe she's a human being, but she certainly thinks that she belongs with us. So we knew from a really early age that Gus had imprinted on humans, which meant that she would never be able to be returned to the wild. And again, that was 27 years ago. So Gus at 27 years in age uh, is certainly considered to be I guess we'll call her a senior citizen. I know that the, I think the Guinness Book of World Records, the oldest living barred owl in captivity was somewhere in the thirties, maybe mid thirties years in age, something like that. So Gus has been around for a long time, but we hope that she'll be around for a, a, a good amount of time also. 
Gus is one of my favorite animal ambassadors to use during educational programs because owls, they're such amazingly well-adapted creatures. They're so beautiful, I think. And there's a lot that we can learn by looking at their physical adaptations up close. And that's, I think, a, a fantastic thing that we found ourselves in doing virtual programs. Instead of being, you know, 10 rows back in an auditorium, you guys have a great view of Gus close up. So you can see, I think she's looking at herself on my computer screen with those big, beautiful eyes. So some people think that barred owls have completely black eyes. I know it's a little tough to see from the camera, but they're actually a really dark brown. And like all owls that are nocturnal, meaning they're the most active during the nighttime, Gus's eyes, her eyeballs are gigantic in proportion to the rest of her head. Uh, I've, I've read a comparison that if we had eyes proportionally the same size as an owl's, they would look like grapefruits sticking halfway out of our heads. And that's what it actually looks like underneath all of those feathers. So on her face, you can see there are some really delicate feathers around her beak. Oh, and that's a great view too. You can see kind of the curvature that looks almost like a satellite dish. Uh, that is called a facial disc. And the, it's thought that that shape helps to funnel sound waves directly to an owl's ears. But there's just so much I could talk about. I'm gonna try not to get off topic. Gus's eyes, those gigantic grapefruit sized eyes are so large that they are fixed into her eye sockets. There are no muscles attached to an owl's eyeballs. The opposite is true for us and for other birds. We, we do have muscles on our eyes. So if we wanted to look around in a different direction, we could keep our heads perfectly still and we can look right, left, up, down. We can look all around without moving our heads a single inch. But if an owl like Gus wanted to look in a different direction, she has to move her entire head to look that way. Those huge eyeballs provide barred owls and other nocturnal owl species with fantastic nighttime vision. And barred owls in the wild will hunt primarily during the nighttime. So it makes sense that they are the most active during the night. Their common prey species or food items are also animals that are active at night. So that could be um, toads and frogs, salamanders, maybe a snake if it's warm in the summertime and they're out at nighttime. Crayfish, barred owls have been observed pouncing on, on crawdads or crayfish in shallow creeks, uh, potentially even a bat if she was fast enough to catch it. But back to that facial disc that I was talking about, uh, equally as impressive, I think, to their eyesight is an owl's hearing. And their ears are much different than ours and much different compared to other birds as well. So Gus's ears are actually located kind of just behind her eyes and they look like open holes. Uh, I think the anatomical term is uh, an operculum. I think it looks like your nostril, just an open hole, no earlobes or anything. One of her ears is larger in diameter, is higher up on her head and towards the front of her face. Gus's other ear is smaller, lower down and towards the back of her head. So that different size and that different relative placement of her ears combined with the satellite dish of her feathers means that she has extraordinarily precise hearing. Not only is it powerful, but because of that different size and location, she can really easily triangulate where sounds are coming from. Another thing I always like to mention when I speak about owls are their feet or their talons. So let's see if Gus will tolerate being a little bit closer. You can see the way that her talons are gripping onto my glove, that she has four digits. And that's true of all owls. Uh, most birds of prey have three toes facing forward and a rear toe and talon, that's called a hallux. What makes owls different from those other birds is that their four digits, two are, are forward facing, the two on the outer end, they're able to rotate 180 degrees. So they're able to crush with two talons from the front and the back, which gives them a really powerful gripping strength. That toe arrangement is referred to as zygodactyl. Another example of a bird species that has zygodactyl feet are woodpeckers. 
They spend a lot of time perching vertically on trees. So having that good grip strength makes a lot of sense. Barred owls get their name from the brown stripes that you can see go vertically on Gus's stomach area. I guess they look like bars to somebody. Uh, but barred owls in Virginia, kind of just more on their natural history. They are one of about eight species that can be seen somewhat regularly throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, I would say that they're probably one of the most common, not just in Virginia, but all throughout the, the southeastern United States. They are actually have been in the news, if you keep up with kind of wildlife and environmental news within the past number of years, because barred owls are moving and expanding their territory westward, and they're out competing some native species on the west coast, namely the spotted owl. So barred owls are not only really well adapted physically to be successful hunters, but behaviorally they can adapt to a, a huge variety of environments, hardwood forests, um, sandy beaches, deserts, arid areas, swampy areas. Um, they are, they're truly one of the most successful owl species that we have in the United States. Uh, let's see, what else can I teach you? Oh, one of my favorite facts to teach people about Gus specifically is that uh, she is much, well, no, I'll pose this question to you guys. You don't have to answer in the chat, but take it to the moment to see if you can guess how much Gus weighs. See if you can guess how many pounds Gus weighs. Keeping in mind that they are the second largest owl species that are seen really regularly in Virginia. Great horned owls are a little bit bigger. Second largest owl species in Virginia, really successful predators. The answer might surprise you. I checked actually just at about 545 during Gus's weekly weigh-in, so we can kind of do a little physical checkup for her. And she tipped the scales at exactly one and a half pounds, 1.5 pounds. So that's a lot lighter than I think most people would anticipate. And I think that's mainly due to their feathers, their plumage. Like a lot of birds, they have an outer layer of feathers. Their primary feathers, those are the ones that they use for flying. You can see there, those are her wing tips. You can see her tail feathers. Those are the really long ones. But all the feathers and all the fluffy uh, down feathers beneath that outer layer, that's what helps them to thermoregulate. That's what helps them to keep cool in the summertime, keep warm in the wintertime, because just like if you have a down puffy jacket or a big outer jacket, uh, that puffy layer of feathers creates a, a layer of air in between the outer layer and her body. So again, everything points back to how adaptable and how amazing these creatures are. Uh, just in terms of owls, other owl species that we see here in, at the Wildlife Center of Virginia as patients, uh, we treat, Let's see, right now, I checked up on our online database before the program started, and right now, in-house, we have about 245 patients. Of all of those, 17 are owls. We have nine barred owls and eight great horned owls, and those are wild birds that are in the rehabilitative process. It's still pretty early in the year, though. Uh, typically, as the seasons change, we see that change reflected in our patient load. So springtime is baby season. We see lots of fledgling birds, lots of baby animals like Virginia opossums that have been separated from their mothers. So right around this time, we will see an explosion in patient numbers for, for those young animals, fledgling owls included. But typically when we see the most owls or, or rather the highest number of owls admitted as patients is in the fall and early winter. And I think that's likely due to their, uh, well, their hunting behavior. So during those winter months, those colder winter months, food availability becomes a little more scarce for wild animals, which means that predators are drawn to places and areas where they might not seek food in warmer, more abundant months, specifically busy roadways. Uh, a large number of owls that we admit as patients have been hit by cars. And Again, we're, we're not there to see the injury happen in real time, but based on the stories that the rescuers tell us and transporters tell us, owls are attracted to busy roadways because they're, they're hunting. They're hunting small rodents, small mammals, reptiles that are attracted to those busy roadways themselves looking for food or food waste. So one of the education and conservation themes that I always like to share when it comes to owls on programs 
is what we call the message of the apple core. And that is when you're driving along in your car, you're eating a good snack, an apple, banana peel, banana, whatever, you're done with that food item, you're driving, instead of keeping it in your car, someone might throw it out the window thinking that they're doing a favor for all those critters out there looking for food. It's a good snack. Things like an apple core, or banana peel, they're biodegradable. They're not as obviously dangerous as like toxic chemicals or broken glass. But the fact of the matter is that no litter is safe litter. And certainly that food waste, that human garbage left behind, which is not really considered to be part of the natural environment or food chain, attracts those small scavenging animals, which in turn attracts their predators. And when owls uh, are struck by vehicles, we see almost every time pretty severe traumatic injuries to their eyes. Because remember, owls' eyes protrude about 50% out of their skulls. Other raptors like eagles and hawks have an orbital ridge, kind of a bony eye socket, kind of just like we do, our brow to protect that sensitive organ. Owls aren't so lucky. So when we do admit owls in the, the highest number, usually in the fall or winter, most of the time they've been hit by vehicles. So I'm wondering if you guys have any questions for me about the Wildlife Center or about Gus or about anything that we've touched on so far. And I see that there are a lot of them that have been plugged into the Q&A session. That's the right place to put them. Uh, so let's see, uh, Stephanie, I think you'll be reading these questions to me. Yes, I will. I'm going to start right now. Um, I'm, um, I, um, I live surrounded by woods and have have looked and looked, but have never never seen one in a tree. What kind of tree, or do they do they hang out in and on? That's a good question. Uh, the oh, she's stretching her wings a little bit. So the that depends on the species. Uh, there are there's a really wide variety of niches, I guess I would say, that owls can fill in Virginia. So we've got species like the barred owl that are pretty large, but we've also got species like the eastern screech owl, which are about the size of a soda can, 12 ounce soda can. Different size bird, different size beaks, different size prey items, which means that they might find themselves in different habitats. So in terms of, I don't know if I could name a, a precise species of tree that you might see an owl in, but not only can we kind of judge or, or guess where a species might be based on their ecological niche, we can also learn a little bit from their natural history and specifically their nesting behavior. So for example, barred owls don't build nests. They are cavity nesters. They might take over an abandoned nest, but they don't build their own nest each year. So that means that you might find them in a tree with a, a hollowed out cavity. You might find them in um, yeah, a, a tree stump high off the ground. Um, alternatively, great horned owls, they do build nests. So they would be looking for trees and forested areas with a big canopy and lots of branches overhead. So again, I don't know if I can give you a specific tree species to look at, but a, a good place to start because owls are so hard to spot during the day is by looking at the base of the trees. If you see a lot of droppings, so like white, white droppings from a bird, that's a good sign. It's an even better sign that it's an owl in that tree if you find pellets. Those are, for, for Gus, they're about the size of, oh, I don't know, maybe about yay big. Uh, and a pellet is a compressed glob of non-digestible animal body parts. So fur, bones, nails. Uh, those things are compressed in an owl's uh, early stages of their digestive system, and they are regurgitated. So those uh, regurgitated pellets usually show up about 24 hours after a meal has been consumed. And some of you may have done that kind of classroom activity when you were kids, dissecting an owl pellet to kind of reconstruct the skeleton. So that, that's a great place to start when you're looking to see where are all the owls. Instead of looking up high in the tree canopy, look on the ground. A similar question. I think you maybe have already covered it, but maybe you want to add something. How do I get started spotting owls and owl out things? Yeah, so that's a great place to start if you're on your own. Um, definitely look for owl pellets, droppings beneath big mature trees. Um, if you're interested in, in just kind of joining a bird spotting group in general, I think that one thing the pandemic has taught us all 
really well is that online communities are a great resource. There are tons and tons of groups on Facebook uh, for people in Virginia and beyond to get together and, and, and try bird spotting or bird watching. And it's a great socially distance activity, especially when it gets a little warmer in the summertime. So, so that's a good place to start. Yeah, check online for communities. How many owl species are there? I did not know this off the top of my head, but I did a quick Google search and worldwide, there are 250 species of owls. In Virginia, there are eight. And let's see if I can name them all. Barred owls, great horned owls, barn owls, eastern screech owls, uh, saw wet owls, snowy owls have been observed during migratory periods, especially over on the on the eastern shore on the coast. And that's six. So I'm missing two and I have no idea what they are. How can I become a, a, an owl handler slash trainer? Yeah, that's a good question. So falconry is a, I wouldn't call it a popular hobby, but it's certainly a hobby with a lot of history. There are falconry groups in Virginia. Um, the way to, I, I haven't looked into it personally, but I know it just kind of being involved with the permitting process is that you need an apprentice handler, or sorry, uh, an experienced handler to take you on as an apprentice first. But I will also say that falconry is sometimes used to for hunting purposes, so that the birds hunt small game and bring it back to the handler. That works great for diurnal birds like hawks and peregrine falcons. Owls would make a very, very poor falconry bird for hunting because they're not awake during the daytime. Uh, they are not as responsive. From what I've experienced as a, a trainer for the ambassadors here, owls tend to be less responsive and less motivated for food rewards than diurnal species might be. I'm not sure the reason why, it might be just the way that their brains are hardwired um, in that behavior. But if you're interested in helping wild owls in, in a rehabilitative setting, I highly recommend that you go to the Department of Wildlife Resources. That's the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. They have a, an extensive list on their website of all the permitted wildlife rehabilitators in the state. And I would bet that every single one of them are looking for help. They're looking for volunteers to help with education animal care. They're looking for help um, preparing meals, looking for help delivering meals. There's a lot of care that goes into wildlife rehabilitation. So in terms of jumping right to handling an owl, I'm not sure the exact steps you can take to that, but there are lots of other ways that you can help out. Next question. My parents bought property in Scottsville and we heard two owl hootings when walking in the woods. How can I know what kind of owl they, owls they are? Right, so barred owls, a good resource, before I start, a good resource for that is Audubon. They have a great website and they have cataloged all the, the calls for species you might see in your area. Barred owls, the best way to remember what their call sounds like is, uh, who, who cooks for you? So I, this is gonna be a really bad impersonation, but stick with me. She, Gus is not impressed at all. So the who cooks for you, that's a barred owl. Um, great horned owls kind of have a, a slower, deeper hoot. Ooh, 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 ooh. Um, Eastern screech owls, despite their name, don't screech at all. They have a, a variety of vocalizations, but those little guys um, will do like a, almost like a horse whinnying. But every owl will vocalize, will vocalize in, uh, in what's called beak clacking. So that's just like what it, it's just what it sounds like. They snap their beak together. And that's usually a sign that they want someone to back off or they're feeling a little bit defensive. So it's a good thing that we haven't heard Gus make that noise yet, despite my bringing here's that close to the camera. Uh, but again, so, so those are the only three impressions that I can do. <laughs> uh, but a lot, there's tons of good information on Autobahn. That's a, that's a great place to start. Another question, not related to owls, but I did visit the center once and met Buttercup, the vulture. How, how is she doing these days? Oh, I'm sorry to say that Buttercup is, he's no longer with us. Um, so Buttercup was an education ambassador, black vulture. 
And the name Buttercup for a Vulture was just outstanding. That was so fantastic. Uh, but our education ambassadors, uh, right now there are, I think around 20, maybe, maybe less than 20. And they are all representative species of, of native, native wildlife in Virginia. Um, but I did mention kind of when I was introducing the Wildlife Center that taking on an education ambassador is a lifelong commitment for the animal and for, for us, the, the caregivers. We have to consider if we have the proper space, the proper resources, the skill in training that, that individual species, but also their, their medical history is something that we take into consideration. Because remember, Gus is, she's one of the exceptions. Physically, she's in, she's in good health. It's her behavior that made her non-releasable. But a lot of other, other ambassadors are non-releasable due to some kind of really traumatic or chronic physical condition. So they're not always in peak physical shape to begin with. Um, Buttercup, he was with us for, I think 15 years, something like that. Uh, but sadly, he, he passed away uh, just last spring sometime. So I'm sad to say that he's no longer with us, but I'm really glad that you had the chance to meet him and that you remember him. That's, I think, what's, what's the most valuable about these ambassadors. What is the average lifespan of a barred owl in nature? And is the lifespan reflective of other species of Virginia owls? Sure. So in general, the bigger the animal, the longer the lifespan. That's not true for every species, but it, it does make a little bit of sense when you think about larger animals having fewer predators than smaller animals might. So for a Eastern screech owl, smallest owl species in Virginia, they have an average lifespan in the wild of five years. In captivity, screech owls can live 10 to 15 years. It, barred owls in the wild can live easily 15 to 20 years in captivity, 30 years plus. Uh, I, I think a good rule of thumb that I tend to share sometime is that it's not crazy to think that our ambassadors will have a lifespan roughly double of what their wild counterparts would be. Remembering that our ambassadors here have it pretty easy. They don't have to hunt for their own food. They have veterinary checkups once a week. They get medications just like your cat or your dog might. They don't have to worry about really anything. So yeah, in captivity, barred owls can live 30 plus years relatively easily. What is Gus's favorite food? Ooh, her favorite food. Well, let's see. Well, I'll tell you that on an average day, she eats dead mice. The reason we feed her dead mice, well, wild barred owls typically would not eat carrion, other dead animals. At the she really doesn't seem to mind at the wildlife center. Um, the reason that we feed our ambassadors raptors dead mice and, and dead prey items is because remember, most of them have some kind of physical condition that would prevent them from capturing that prey. Prey items can fight back. We don't want our raptors to become injured in any way because of that. Also, we don't want live prey items to escape and infest other enclosures that we have on our property. So on an average day, Gus eats mice. She eats about 80 grams of mice. Uh, she weighs 720 grams total. So that's, I'm not even going to try to do the mental math, but it's, it's a small percentage of her overall body weight, a tenth or less, I think, or 10% or less. Um, on Wednesdays, that's a special day. Gus gets dead chicks instead of dead mice. So that's nice. It sounds gross to us, but it's a good enriching meal for her because it's something different. And also while during training sessions, we would chop up her food and deliver it bit by bit, just like training a dog with treats. It's the same thing with raptors. On Wednesdays, she gets whole food items uh, and because that's another good kind of mental stimulation. She can use her beak and her talons to shred and tear that food. Um, which one is her favorite between the two? I'm going to guess the mice. Okay. Um, another question, how long are her legs? So her legs, uh, sometimes she can be, uh, I think she will tolerate me touching her sometimes. So I'll try to gently place my fingertip where her legs meet her torso. About there. 
So just like it's kind of deceiving with her weight compared to her appearance, uh, the length of her legs are also much longer than what you see with, you know, from the outside. Another question, um, does Gus interact with any of the other owl patients? So patients, no. Um, Gus lives in an outdoor enclosure that she, had, she has one all to herself. There was a time when we attempted to house education ambassadors of the same species in the same enclosure. Uh, the problem that we discovered with that, particularly when it comes to owls, because uh, when their, their food is delivered, if it's not during a training session where we're hand feeding bit by bit, because owls eat at night, they don't typically eat in front of us during the daytime, we had no way to tell who was eating what until we realized that during weekly weight check-ins that one individual was gaining a lot of weight and one individual was losing a lot of weight. So Gus, she lives by herself in an enclosure, but it's not isolated. She is next door neighbors with a peregrine falcon on one side and to her other side, uh, a red-tailed hawk. So, so she's, she's not isolated. She sees other education raptors. She sees our staff members walking back and forth, going to patient enclosures all the time. Um, and we do have another barred owl ambassador whose name is Athena. And she, Athena lives kind of across the road from Gus. And so it's really cute. Sometimes we hear them hooting to each other especially during the, the early hours of the evening and, and really early in the morning. Um, but in terms of the patients, Gus doesn't interact with them because those are wild birds. We, we try really hard to keep their wildness. So their patients are in enclosures that are away from the public view, away from areas where staff members would be casually walking back and forth. So interacting with patients, not so much, but with ambassadors, certainly. How large would an um, owl's eye be? How large would an owl's eye be? Well, again, that depends on the species. I'm trying to think if I can compare Gus's eyes to any real world item. I would say, hmm, bigger, bigger than an egg corn, smaller than a ping pong ball. Okay, Thank, thanks for the great visual. What does Gus's hoot sound like? I think you've already covered that one, but do you have additional comments on that at all? No, that's the who cooks for you. Who cooks for you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. That's a great, great um, imitation. Does Gus have a toy? Ooh, yeah, so the education raptors all receive enrichment items throughout the week, multiple times per week. So an enrichment item is anything that is um, mentally or physically different and stimulating for these animals. So sometimes for Gus, it's an empty tissue box that we stuff with crumpled up newspapers and mouse bits that she has to kind of dig and find to get out. Other times it is uh, maybe a, a frozen block of ice with a chick that's kind of sticking up through the ice like a popsicle almost. So those enrichment items, very often they're food-based. Um, they're not always, but, but they're really important in, in the overall health and well-being of the ambassadors because, again, they're in captivity. They're, they live here for the rest of their lives. So making sure that they have a variety of items and, and different food sources to enjoy and, and kind of play with, that's, that's certainly important. Yep. Uh, I've heard that pest traps or poison bait baits are, are particularly dangerous to owls. Is that true? What other household dangers should we consider? Yeah, that is true. So rodenticide is the poison that is placed in, um, yeah, poison pest traps. Um, unfortunately, this, is, this reminds me of the, the message of the apple core that I shared earlier. Um, owls and other predators are drawn to those easy food sources. So uh, and of course the owl has no way of knowing if that rodent is full of rodenticide or not. So just like, I think a, a really great well-known example is DDT, the pesticide in the, seven, the early, the let's say fifties and sixties that um, worked its way up the food chain because it didn't break down from prey species to ingestion from predator species. 
That's the same thing with rodenticide. So that is certainly a danger to, to owls and other raptors in Virginia. Um, other considerations, other things that might harm owls. Um, <laughs> oh, one easy thing I think is keeping your windows safe for birds, not just owls, but, but perching birds and other birds as well. Um, there are many different products that you can find relatively cheaply that are almost like see-through or translucent stickers um, that you can put on the inside or outside of your window that just create that visual barrier for birds so they don't crash into those windows on accident. Another good thing that anybody can do if you have bird feeders in your backyard, move them away from your windows or away from the side of your house. So there's a, there, there are lots of different ways that you can kind of help protect owls. And a lot of those ways are just directly related to humans changing our behavior. Um, I'm just going to ask you that uh, there's one person, um, Diane, who had um, had a question and she lost signal for a bit. So she, was, I don't think she heard your answer. How long are owl's legs? Oh, so let's see. She let me do it once. Let's see if I can do it again. I'm going to put my fingertip where her hip joint is. Right there. Oh, she's been really tolerant. She's been a nice owl today. Thank you very much for that. Can folks can folks visit the wildlife center? So unfortunately, we're we're not doing any kind of in-person programs um, due to the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, however, we are we have a lot of virtual and online opportunities. Uh, whenever we do events just like this, when we're invited to present, if it's open to the public, we'll always try to post that to our event calendar that's on wildlifecenter.org. Um, but like I said, right now, we're not doing any in-person programs, but, but check on the website because that might change later on in the summer or the early fall. Uh, there's a chance that we'll open up the center for open house tours, more open to the public programs. Um, but just on an average day, an average daily basis, disregarding COVID-19, the Wildlife Center is not open to the public uh, because we are primarily a, a hospital. Uh, our ambassadors do have an area that is accessible to be seen from scheduled tour groups. So that is included in the, the it's kind of like a field trip that schools and, and private groups can take. But right now, we're not doing those, unfortunately. And one final question that I have so far in the, in the Q&A is, are house cats up House cats outdoors a problem for owls. Ooh, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot I could say about that. Bottom line, yeah, domestic house cats, they're not wild animals. They're considered invasive species. House cats are direct outdoor cats are and feral cats are directly responsible for billions of songbird and raptor deaths throughout the United States every year, billions every year. Uh, and it's not the cat's fault. They're predators. They're acting as a predator would. They don't know any better. So again, it's, it's all about changing human behavior. And the key to changing behavior is through education. So certainly house cats are a threat to even owls. Probably not a fully grown barred owl like Gus. Uh, but when owls are fledglings, when they're learning to fly, just like every other bird species, there's a high likelihood that they will take a tumble from the nest, end up sitting on the ground for sometimes more than a few hours. And ordinarily, hopefully those, those fledgling birds can kind of crawl using their talons, crawl back up to the nest and try again. But when they're on the ground like that, they're just, they're sitting, well, sitting owls, sitting ducks for attacks from cats, yeah. So, so yeah, to answer your question, an adult owl, Outdoor cats probably don't pose much of a threat, but for fledgling owls, absolutely. And, um, one more question. How do you handle getting dead chicks and dead mice? Where do they come from? Oh, uh, <laughs> they come from a supplier, a distributor. Um, I don't know the name of the company, but they must have a really successful business because we order mice and chicks and rats and fish by the truckload. Uh, again, on average, we will treat 3,500 patients per year. And a lot of those are carnivores and require that protein. So I, I don't know exactly where they come from, but it is, they, they are, they're captive bred 
So it's a, it's a professional business supplier, yeah. I think that's all the questions. I hope, I hope we answered everyone. Um, it's now um, 7.19, so, uh, or 7.20. So um, we have a couple more minutes if there are a couple more questions. If not, maybe I'll turn it over to Betty. Well, um, I think we'll go ahead and get into Betty's portion here. And uh, Alex, thank you so much. That was just incredible. Um, and thanks to Gus. She's absolutely gorgeous. And thanks for all your wonderful questions, folks. That was fascinating. Yeah, thank you for having me. And those are fantastic questions. Thank you guys for, for making this a fun conversation. Uh, I'm, I'm actually going to log off the call, if that's OK. Uh, it's time for Gus to go back into her enclosure. So with that, again, I'll say thank you guys so much for inviting us. And uh, well, well, hopefully we'll see you online sometime soon. Thanks so much. Bye, Gus. Bye, guys. And, um, Bye, Gus. Thank you. Thank you very much for all your um, expertise. A great talk. And, see ya. Uh, you want to hang on for the last few minutes here. I'll just share my screen again, folks. We're done with the Q&A, so I'm going to introduce to you Betty DeZamba, who is a longtime board member um, of Wild Virginia, and she is the chair of Outings and Education here. And go ahead and take it away, Betty. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. I had muted myself so I wouldn't have any background noise um, so that everyone could hear Alex. But um, I thank you all for coming. And um, you know, this year has been a year of outings that are actually indoors, um, but it has given us a chance, I think, to reach out um, to people who maybe couldn't drive to, you know, wouldn't have the time to drive. Or I noticed we have people with us today from Florida and other in Michigan and other states. So. Welcome to all of you. And um, at least there's something good that has come out of COVID. And all I wanted to um, wanted to tell you about was one of Wild Virginia's campaigns, which is about habitat connectivity. And so this is about making sure that animals have places that they can migrate and that those places are connected in ways that are safe. And as part of that, um, as part of that campaign, Misty, our executive director, has really taken the lead on um, establishing this collaborative called the Virginia Safe Wildlife Corridors Collaborative. And you'll notice, um, you'll notice in the group of organizations that are part of the collaborative here that Wild Virginia is one, and the Wildlife Center of Virginia is another one. So our um, talk tonight is not our only collaboration. Um, the other thing that I think you'll notice that amazed me when I first saw it is the variety of groups that are involved in this collaborative. So you have everything from state agencies like VDOT and um, DWR, federal agencies like the National Park Service, educational institutions such as William and Mary and Virginia Tech, um, and then conservation groups like Wild Virginia, Wildlands Network, Piedmont Environmental Council. And this um, multi-stakeholder approach um, is I think you know, somewhat unique. And so far it is, it is bearing fruit. So we um, have had in the last two years, legislative success. Um, and what this success was, was that last year um, a bill was passed that um, that the state will have a wildlife corridor action plan. And this plan um, will look at where um, land is that animals are living in, how um, animals might travel from one place to another, and then look at ways that we can enhance that, whether it be um, underpasses, underneath highways, or whether it be um, um, underpasses for large animals, whether it be projects like you may have seen on I-64 near Charlottesville where there's fencing to encourage deer not to 
cross I-64 um, on the road surface, but rather to go under it. And then um, this second year, there was a further bill. And this bill um, is such that key agencies, when they're doing planning, so for example, VDOT's planning a new road, they need to incorporate wildlife corridors and road crossings into those plans. And um, the state forester is involved with that, the Department of Conservation and Recreation. And so this is all really exciting. Um, it's amazing to have um, so many different groups on board. The legislation passed with bipartisan support, which I think as everyone knows is sort of an unusual, unusual thing. So we're really excited about it. We're looking forward to seeing what comes next. Um, so I think in addition to safe roadway crossings, we'll be looking at aquatic connectivity. So for example, if you have a stream that has a culvert underneath the road and you get flooding and, all, and sticks come in and they sort of um, cover that culvert, maybe that culvert should be replaced with a much larger passageway for the water such that it won't be plugged um, and aquatic species are able to move from one place to another. So um, thank you for um, your support and um, hopefully we'll have more news soon about where this campaign is going. Awesome, thanks Betty. Um, and I am just gonna close us out here really quick. Can everyone see that or is it nothing? Well, I'm just gonna go without my slides because they're not cooperating. Um, but anyway, thank you so much to everyone for attending tonight. Um, and we truly appreciate it and hope that you enjoyed meeting Gus and learning all that wonderful information. Um, and again, please consider joining Wild Virginia as a yearly member and uh, your generosity uh, keeps us doing this important work to educate about and protect our favorite wildlife and our favorite places. Um, and we will send out a recording and more information in a follow-up email, um, as well as some links about the Wildlife Center of Virginia and how you can also support their work and you can adopt an animal. Um, and so thank you so much for coming and supporting Wild Virginia and the Wildlife Center of Virginia. And we will bid you good night, folks. Thank you.